kick off your boots, and put down your hunting knife. It's time for the Outdoor Man Podcast with the man himself, Outdoor Man Dan. Join us for fun stories, useful how-tos, and insights into what being an outdoorsman means today and what it may mean in the future. From ethical hunting and conservation to new stories to tell around the fire. Let's get into today's show with your host, Outdoor Man Dan. Hey, so this episode is with Eat the Country, or more as it is actually named, known for is Tom Radford. Okay, it's all about foraging, sustainable food. He does a bit of guiding as well. He's a man, if you want to forage, and it's become more and more apparent that people want to, then he is the guy for the job. And in this episode, that was you will hear his love, his passion, and also a little bit about how we got about starting doing it and where to go for yourselves and a little bit about what you should be doing. He's an absolute fun guy. Now, talking about fun guy, as we do in this episode, this episode I have been using, um, before now I've been using Magic Mind. Now, Magic Mind is a fantastic shot of productivity um it's got lion's mane and it's got loads of natural things in it as well it's you know it gives you sustained energy and focus there's it's no crash there's no come down or jitters from it it reduces stress and anxiety it is an absolute fantastic little shot now you can in the, in the link in the bio you've got the um the discount code outdoor, outdoor man tech outdoor 10 or you can go to um, Magic Mind and just get it. Or you can go look in the bio for the link, and you'll and you'll see there of what you can get. Now, if you're not a coffee drinker, because like I say this 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 drink gives you everything. Like it, it's it's caffeine free. It's um, helpful. It's got antioxidants in it. So like I said, it boosts your energy. It's got lion's mane in it. It boosts memory. It's, it produces your moods. You decreases stress. Decreases inflammation. Heat with antioxidants and supports your immune system. So why look any further? Hit them up, have a look. Yeah, check them out. But if you want to hear more about mushrooms and where you can find your own, then stay tuned for this fantastic episode. So this week's episode is with Tom Radford. Now, Tom, I found him on Instagram, uh, Eat the Country. He's a blogger. He's, um, I've actually written down here influenza, but I think, I, I think I'm an influenza. Infl- yeah, it's easy for you to say. Filmmaker, content creator, and an amazing guy. That's what it said on his LinkedIn anyway, that bit. From mushrooms foraging to other projects, we're going to hear it all. So, Tom, thank you very much for coming on. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you for, for inviting me, and uh, thank you for that uh, rather grand introduction from LinkedIn or uh, Facebook for dead people, as I call it. Yeah. <laughs> because- <laughs> I mean, I think LinkedIn's really useful, but it's quite boring and quite hard to navigate. But I'm actually starting to use it more these days. But I suppose that's a, that is sort of my introduction to some extent. What are we going to talk about? It was the, the foraging that started me off when I found you. It was it was well, what this and you'd been. I can't believe you'd made something. Now I'd found. We'll start from the beginning. Where how did how did the foraging thing start? Long story short, I originally I grew up in the New Forest many, many years ago and, you know, usual sort of childhood, climbing trees, building dens, etc. And then when I was about 12 years old, someone gave me Lofty Wiseman's SAS Survival Handbook, which was, became my Bible as a kid, you know, going out with your pen knives and all this kind of thing. And I got into a little bit of foraging then and we'd do things like we'd find, uh, you know, seps and we'd do things like primrose and uh, all kind of fact, we, I think we ate some things that you weren't supposed to eat, but we seemed to survive. And I really had a really a, a great interest in it. And anyway, then life took over, and uh, you know, life and family and living in London and all those things. And then I got into IT, which was dull as hell, but did it because we had the kids and all that. Anyway, I ended up in Singapore when I was in my forties and got into into video production, and I was extremely homesick. And so I used to watch things like River Cottage and stuff, and I and um, and think, well I'd, well, I'd like to go back, you know, and get do the, use the video production, and then get back into those skills again and do something with that. And also, I wanted to do stuff about you know local seasonal sustainable produce, low carbon, that kind of thing. I wanted to give it some sort of a, an edge to it, and you know. So I came back to London, I got divorced, and I had a bit of time in my hands and did a few projects with with a few friends that didn't didn't kind of work out, but it was a good good sort of grounding to get into this. And then, weirdly enough, I mean, where are we now? We're in we're in February, aren't we? So it was probably November 2021. I thought, right, I'm going to start again. And I can't be this idea, eat the country. And I like the name because I thought, well, I could eat this country. And then maybe if it worked, I could go and eat France. 
it's not just about eating it's about all the sorts of things in the, in the countryside and it could also be about cities as well it's about it's about what comes from this country and what you can find and i'm really interested and i'm interested you know i love meeting like local producers and you know on my travels i've met all kinds of people like snail farmers and goat farmers and all these people you know and i thought right well, this would be interesting so what should i start with well i didn't have much money so we'll all start with the foraging and i had a, a certain amount of knowledge already so i was literally just going up to the local park in wandsworth where i live few plants that i recognized you know the obvious ones you know and some were some were edible and some weren't and i came up with this idea a sort of catchphrase death or dinner so ivy you know you're either going to eat it or, or it's going to kill you i mean obviously that actually turns out that there aren't that many plants in this country that will kill you there are plenty that will but mostly it's about death or it'll make you throw up or, or you know or make you crap yourself or something and so it was it was like that essentially so, and i and i started doing it and on instagram and it wasn't really doing that well and someone said to me why don't you do it on tiktok for a bit and I thought, well, I mean, TikTok's for kids jumping around, isn't it? I thought, I'm, you know, I'm getting long in the tooth for that. So I'll give it a go. So I put it on TikTok and I put this death or dinner film I'd made about hemlock. And of course, everyone loves hemlock because it's just like the most lethal thing. Apparently Socrates was involved in the death of Socrates and all that. And I put that on there. And I woke up the next morning and I already had 2,000 followers and it had like, you know, four or 5,000 views, which I thought was a lot then. And it went on to get over, over a million, this one film. So I just thought, well, this is fun. So I just started making stuff every day. And I kept on posting on Instagram. And I did a couple of more films that did quite well. And then one that really did well was this was this one about, about uh, giant hogweed. Because the thing about I, I, it was giant hogweed, but the one I found was small, even though I knew it was the same plant. And everyone's going, that's not giant hogweed. And I said, well, he said, yeah, they're 15 feet high. I'm like, well, they're not, they don't start that. They're actually small and they have to grow. <laughs> so I got into all these arguments with these people that's not it and of course it, then you suddenly realize that the, the posts where people start arguing you is the ones that go viral and then yeah then towards the end of this year i just kept on doing it and of course got into mushroom season and everybody loves a mushroom you know everybody loves the risk of mushrooms everyone loves eating mushrooms and of course you then have mushrooms which have got slightly slightly other features <laughs> properties and i made a film about uh, amanita muscaria which is obviously the, the the red the classic red and white mushroom and at the time, I was with my friend Freya from Freya Forages, who's who's awesome. And she was like recounting all these stories that she tells her because she does professional foraging trips. And she was recounting all these stories about how people in, you know, and we're not sure which culture it was, but they used to follow reindeer around and drink the reindeer's urine from the snow, sort of slushies and getting high and which I thought was hilarious. And she should oh, she'd also fa- found out that, that, that they used to drink the urine of the shamans as well sometimes because the shaman would then take all the nastiness from the mushroom and they'd drink that. And I just thought it was hilarious. I thought, you know, how 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 bad did you want to go on a spiritual trip? Or how bad did you want to get high that you're actually going to drink a cup of warm shaman piss? Because <laughs> I thought, I mean, I wasn't going to go into any shamans or any particular cultures or anything. I was just saying drinking urine is, is is strange and funny and people probably don't do it anymore. The same way that anything on horrible histories would be like that. Anyway, this film went out and it really took off. I think it was in America. They all thought I was having to go at indigenous cultures or something, which was completely, <laughs> couldn't have been any further from the truth. And they all started fighting each other and it got really 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 fight i mean like going mad and this thing ended up picking about four million views or something and i just sat back and thought well this is crazy but then my instagram just went bananas so that's where i'm now with a with a good following but in terms of the foraging it's an interesting subject because i was talking to the bbc the other day and they said to me oh you know do you want to come on and, and do uh do a bbc slot i said well yeah okay why not it was it was just bbc sussex or something and then they said, uh, they said, all right, well, well, tell us all about your expertise. And I said, well, my expertise, as with most foragers, is what I've learned as I go along. Most of the foragers I know, none of them have any kind of qualifications. Foraging is about learning as you go. It's about trying. It's about talking to friends. It's about researching. And you learn what you learn and you know what you know. And, and when you give out the information, you're very careful not to tell anybody something that's just going to harm them, you know. And so that's kind of what I do. And I, I learn an awful lot in the space of a year. I had a decent grounding in it, but I've learned a heck of a lot more. But there's always more to learn. And I don't know anybody that knows even a tenth of it. I mean, there must be 10,000 mushrooms in this country of different yeah. species. And I don't know anybody that knows even half of them or less. So it's it's an exciting journey. And I was I was down with the guys in uh, the guys in Whitstable who do these, um, they're called Urban Farm IT. And they do with mushroom kits. I was foraging with him. And he's a fisherman. He used to be a fish farmer. Fish farmer. And he described foraging like like going fishing. You know, when you're wandering around and it's like you'll find the little tiny mushrooms, which are a bit crap. It's like when you catch some crap fish, but you're waiting to get that bass or you're waiting to get that. And he said, it's that buzz. It's that same buzz. And it is. And it's like a, when you go out foraging, it's like a real 
it's a bit of an adventure. And then if you find something you don't know, you call up your friends or you, you look it up or you get your book out or whatever it is. And then, and then you double check and you triple check and then you make a film about it and, and you learn as you go. And I think it's, I think it's kind of addictive and there's a sort of a zeitgeist around it at the moment. People are really, really interested in it. ever since COVID people getting out and about people worried they can't pay the bloody electricity bills. So they, you know, <laughs> I will go and, go and find some food in the woods, you know. So, yeah, that's kind of the basis of how it all came about as to, as to where I am now. Well, yeah. So the zombie apocalypse thing since COVID has gone has gone mental. And I always call it the zombie apocalypse thing because that's where all the nutcases come from. And, and you said in about the the foraging, even like the meat side of things as well. So f- getting more sust- um, sustainable meat, you know, whether it's hunting, deer, stalking or even getting roadkill i saw some guy on instagram who eats roadkill the whole thing a film, isn't it? yes it is I'm... I just hate birmingham you used to live is in like that, birmingham yeah. used, to, used to eat roadkill and i think the bbc or so we had made something about him i had a friend who did it once when he was coming home drunk but i don't i don't even know he cooked it <laughs> <laughs> there was a guy in birmingham who say he lives on a roundabout in a tent or wolverhampton out that way and they made a documentary on him and, and he was like eating badges and all sorts but yeah, so so the whole thing's got has gone mental. And you, you look at all the Instagram things and like what you're doing, the foraging has just gone through the roof. And I think it's awesome that people are getting more and more involved. Shouldn't go trespassing, but they're getting more and more involved. No, no, you've um, got to obey the rules, yeah. I'm surprised you should go foraging in Richmond. You'll get some venison in Richmond Park. <laughs> yeah, you get, do you know what? You're not allowed to forage in Richmond Park. Um, Are you not? And I... I no, no, you, it's the Royal Parks you can't forage in. So I've, I've gone there and I've made films about stuff, but you can't take anything. I mean, wow. and I, I tend to respect that, you know, if it's a Royal Park. There's plenty. I mean, you can go up to, up to I think Hampstead Heath is all right, although I never find anything there because uh, usually some people have got there before me. You know, you don't, I mean, I go to places like Putney Heath, Tooting Beck. And then when I get out of London, I go down to, um, there's a, there's woods up near Seven Oaks, which have got like, like, really quite nice and obviously um you know places like that and there's lots to be found you know of all sorts and i take the view that you know i I don't tend to forage lots and lots to eat at the moment because it tends to be that i'm more interested in finding the things and educating when i i actually don't have my own place at the moment so when i get my own place i want to do more on it around taking it back and cooking it and those sorts of things but because i can't really make those films at the moment i tend to just like get down there and make the film and talk about it yeah people are so fascinated and also I take that I try and make it a bit funny because we were talking before the podcast about Country File. And I grew up watching Country File, and I think it's a valid program. I think it talks about a lot of issues in the countryside, and you can't argue with that because there aren't many programs that do. But I just think the delivery is a bit dry. And I, my sort of initial thoughts on myself was like, you know, if you look at what Top Gear did with a car show, they made it funny and interesting, you know, regardless of what you think about Clarkson, I'll park that one for now. But, and I just thought, well, why can't we make it funny? Why can't it be funny talking about the, why can't we realize, show people that countryside people, because I grew up in the countryside and they're funny and it, the countryside is a rock and roll cool place. Yeah. And and it gets this, this rap that it's just boring and, you know, full of yokels and, you know, and, and people, grumpy people, you know, everyone can be grumpy if you, if you, if you say the wrong thing, but I find that, and it's amazing. And, you know, meeting people out there, who, you know, I always say you can't judge a person till you walk a mile in their shoes. You know, you can't judge people who run a farm or, or a shoot or something until you actually go out there and see why they're doing it. You know? Yeah. So it's, it's, I find that's, it's a controversial thing. And it's, I made a film yesterday about chicken. You believe you saw that one and it's, it's caused a bit of, bit of an uproar, but the people have to face these issues instead of getting angry about them, talk about them, you know, Sorry, yeah. I'm ranting on. it's true. Um, so prime example is, um, actually I've got two examples. First one is my um, sister-in-law who is, is lovely before I say any more. And, <laughs> and she eats meat. Okay. She's not vegan. She's not vegetarian. She eats meat. But you say to her, oh, yeah, I'm going to shoot a deer or I'm going off hunting. Now, okay, the hunting side of things I kind of get. But, like, if you eat meat and you then screw your nose up at somebody who's going to shoot, a, you know, a rabbit or a deer or something, like, hang on a minute, that's a little bit on the nose. Let's let's be let's be adult about this. You know, the chicken comes from somewhere, whether it's in a shed, force-fed grub and whatever else, and, and you know, it's it battery farmed right through to – your wild rabbit hopping along who's had a life and then just happens to be unlucky enough to be shot and put in the pot. And it's, there's no difference there, but unfortunately people don't see it like that. And, it, and, it, and it's, it's kind of a shame really. There's like a double standard to it. I mean, obviously it's an old story. I stalked a deer 
in 2021 and I was going to before I was going to do it I was talking to a mate of mine in London about it and I was explaining to him about animal husbandry about looking after you know the herd and what that happens to the herd if they get too many deer and what they do to the trees and to each other and the spread of infections and all these sort of things and it doesn't matter how I positioned it he couldn't see it as something that was that should be done he said you know you should you should you shouldn't enjoy killing things I said I don't enjoy killing things in fact the worst part about it is the killing I don't actually like that bit yeah. I like the stalking. It's very exciting. Yeah. The only thing yeah. that I was interested in in the in terms of the killing was that I had made sure we did a lot of practice the day before. But if I'm going to shoot something, it dies painlessly. And I was, you know, I would have been furious with myself if that animal had suffered in any way. But the, I was with a, a very experienced stalker. He, that we saw a number of deer. He wouldn't. He would. He had to pick the right animal for the herd. You know, it's not willy nilly. These people have this idea that people shoot stuff indiscriminately, and I'm sure there are people that do. Yeah. But then nobody that I would associate with, and with hunting, I mean, we you know we talk about pheasants, and I know there's a lot of there's a lot of obscure information on both sides, and I actually I, you know in the next few weeks I'm going to start looking into that on the basis of this post and some of the things because I I don't know 100 percent about it. I mean, I take the view that no matter how you position it, a pheasant has a better life than an yeah. intensely reared. There's no question about that. I do think that there are there are big shoots that abuse the whole thing and end up yeah, burying them burning the and i'm totally against that but then if you've got a small country shoot you know with a bunch of people that are good shots they want to make sure that they do a proper job they eat the meat and the farmer can get you know good money off a peg that if he's only got normally going to get in two two or three hundred pounds for an acre and you know for that season he can actually make a good bit of income that goes into the local economy it's a difficult thing to argue with unless you actually go out there and try and live his life you know the pheasant thing is, is funny so i was a gamekeeper i still am kind of i sort of dabble at it now I'm trying to step away from it. And the more I try and step away from it, the more I'm sort of drawn in, especially doing the podcasts and the videos. But if you look at a shoot, you've got your big commercial shoots, which are controversial at best. Don't really do the countryside much much good with um, overpopulating pens. And it does, you know, ground cover and that doesn't do it very good. I agree. But whatever way you look at it, gamekeepers can produce wildlife because of everything they're doing. You go around and shoot, you see wildlife. Just an article for a magazine, actually, about, about this. So they produce wildlife. There's meat that goes back into the um, into the economy very cheaply, unless you buy it from a restaurant. If you want to buy a pheasant, it's about twenty p for a for a pheasant. If you go straight to the streets, absolutely, yeah. Also, on top of that, you have the likes of pubs and restaurants that, that benefit from it. You have the fuel and the car mechanics, all that benefit from it because people are buying the big tires. The fuel will go in the cars, and all of a sudden, this big web of of something has happened, and that, well, it's all come from shooting. I think shooting for businesses is bigger than golf for business deals and stuff like that. It's more really? deals. Yeah, it used definitely used to be. It might have changed now. I haven't looked at, at statistics, but it used to be the fact that more business deals are done through shooting than playing golf, stuff like that. This is a massive, massive, massive web. I spoke to Blood Origins about trophy hunting ages ago, one of my first podcasts I ever done. Fantastic company, Blood Origins. And we're talking about what I wanted to really speak about was proper, what I'd call trophy hunting, as in going and shoot your zebras, your lions, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. We got onto the subject of in the UK, they were on about, as in big stags and stuff like that, and being able to export the heads and and whatnot. What goes into a day's, for, for, to shoot one stag, apart from the money that goes into the estate for that stag, is usually in a state that'll have a B&B somewhere or it'll have a, a hotel. So, that, so the money goes into that. You obviously have the flights, so people flying in from abroad to do it, or might even have somebody from the UK, uh, from England, fly up to Scotland. So there's that money into the into that. And all of a sudden, like I said a minute ago, the web of cash that sort of spreads out from that one thing is fantastic. And people don't, so people just don't see it, unfortunately, or, or or maybe they don't want to see it. I don't know what the answer is there, really. Well, there are some people that, I mean, the trouble is, when you say the word estate, and people will immediately think, oh, well, some posh, you know, whatever. I mean, some of these estates are owned by TOFs, so there's no doubt about it. In terms of pheasant shooting, personally, I mean, I've never shot pheasant. I've done, I did partridge 20, 25 years ago once, and I think I did, I, I did a couple of other things. I mean, deer stalking, I, I would do because I, as long as it's done properly. No, I agree. I mean, I think it is associated with a certain type of people. There's a stereotype around it, and I say, I'm, if things are done ethically, if people eat the meat, if they're good shots, and they make sure the birds die, you know, if you just don't know what the hell you're doing, a bunch of blooming Essex boys go up there and then shooting yeah. into pieces. Of that, that, that's just yeah. bang out. Of you. you know, you, you've got to have that responsibility. If you're going to kill an animal, you've got to kill it dead, and you've got to know what you're doing. And I don't think you should be allowed out there unless you're doing that. But the funny, this funny thing that's associated with like posh people and stuff. Now, most of the guns I know are quite the opposite. 
In fact, I went out with a girl a year or two ago, a Yorkshire lass. It was hilarious. She was a witch as well, which was kind of fun. But <laughs> that was her thing. Every weekend she'd go shooting, literally salt of the earth, and all her friends were too. There's a whole load of them up there. I wanted to do like a little short short thing about them called Lipstick and Two Smoking Barrels, you know. <laughs> because <laughs> Because you, you know, there's a whole load of, of, of ladies that do it. These are not posh people. They're not rich people. It's just something that they enjoy. They get out in the countryside. They do it socially and they eat what they shoot, you know. But unfortunately, like anything, as you say, all these big businesses, it gets abused and then it gets a bad it gets a bad rap. I also know that, of course, you know, when you're up with the big commercial shoots, because people were saying on, on, on the feed on my post, you know, about the amount of pheasants that can do damage to the countryside. And I agree, if you're going to start bringing you know, 50 million of them in, then of course you're going to screw up the countryside. You know, it's, and I, I don't agree with that. I think everything should be done in moderation. I think it should be done at a local level if it's going to happen at all. Yeah. Also, you, you're talking about rabbits and things as well. I mean, you know, rabbits is, is good game. You're not going to run out of rabbits any more than you're going to run out of pigeons. There's you know, there's untold numbers of them. And if you go out and shoot, shoot yourself a bunch of pigeons, if you take the breast, you put it in the freezer, you eat the meat, you know, you may be doing the farmer a favour. There's there's all sorts of controversy about what amount of damage pigeons do. I'm fairly confident that most of the farmers I've spoken to say the pigeons do plenty of damage. Uh, rabbits do a lot of damage. And, you know, do you like rabbits or you like horses? Because if you're on a horse and its leg goes down a rabbit hole, well, that's the end of that. So it's it's a difficult one, you know, because, you know, the, the adage I used to use is like, you know, well, if you think a rabbit's so important, you know, and you think that a rabbit's got more like right to life than a plant, well, which has got more right to life? a 250 year old oak tree or a rabbit yeah if you understand an ecosystem a plant's got far more right to life than a rabbit but i do appreciate that it's these people that enjoy death this assumption is anybody who's got a gun enjoys death and i don't think that's right at all I mean, gun is a tool for a lot of people and most of the stalkers i've met are some of the nicest most but they care about animals they care about animal welfare they care about the land they won't do anything that will upset the balance this is the story that doesn't get told you know yeah no, exactly. I I done a short video on on a bit of rabbiting last year, and I'm gonna do a little bit more. Like I said, I want to do some with the girls this year and introduce the girls to the ferrets. That will be done the next couple of weeks, I would think, before there's too many baby rabbits get a boat. Which I'm mm-hmm. looking forward to doing. But it's, it's a great meat source as well. It's higher in protein than a lot of other meats, so the gym junkies really should be eating it, you know. And yeah, right, it's, it's a story I could talk about for, for a very long time. I'm conscious of our time. Projects. So you've got a new project on the way. I have a few projects that I'm working on. I mean, for a start, I've just set up my YouTube channel. I still, I've got quite a lot of followers. I haven't managed to actually monetize it yet. I mean, people are sending me things. I mean, you only send, I can only drink so much booze, you know, and I don't need stuff. I need, you know, I want, I want, I want this to be an income so I can have more time to do it and I can make better content and I can, and, and, and people are entertained and I want to get out and start talking. So projects I want to do um, this year, I'm going to work with my, with my friends to, you know, I want to get my skills up to a level where I can do foraging courses, but make them interesting and fun. Not that they aren't already, but I want to amp it up a bit. You know, I like to talk about folklore. I like to talk, if I find out any silly facts, you know, if I, if a mushroom's got a rude shape, it's got a rude shape. Let's let's make let's make a joke about it. It's fine, you know. Other projects, I have got a, a couple of ideas for TV shows, and I'm talking to a couple of people about that. I mean, that might be down the line. Um, it might be worth maybe trying to get a book or something done first i don't know what which comes first but i'd like to do something like that because or even a, a big youtube thing which maybe then wharfs into that and i, I won't actually tell you the the, the idea because obviously uh, the way the world is someone might nick it but essentially it's going to be around local seasonal sustainable food foraging and british stuff you know i I'm, i've got nothing i mean I, you know, lots of great i love champagne i love coffee i love tea and all sorts of things that come in from abroad but i'm just very curious about what we've got in this country and and what we can do which is low carbon you know someone was having a go the other day you know going out and having a big fry up you know i don't do it all the time but once a week or something i like to have a fry up um, and they're like, oh, why haven't you got an avocado on it? I'm like, because I don't need something that's traveled 10,000 miles for my breakfast when there's a pig farm up the road. And I used to have one of these T-shirts, Pritch, no avocados this Christmas, bitch. You know, um, no strawberries this Christmas, bitch. That's not in season. Yeah. You know, and people say, oh, well, you can grow strawberries in the, in, in the UK in the winter. You can, and you need heated, you know, polytunnels and greenhouses and yeah. all this stuff to do it. You know, there's plenty of lovely things to eat in the winter. And you've got a freezer in your house, you know? <laughs> put it in that freezer and then bring out the the fruit in the winter so those kinds of things i mean also i'm possibly going to get into some merchandising but that's something that i'm still looking at i'll do anything i mean let's just try it it's fun the whole social media thing is great fun i mean have you got plans to do stuff with yours or are you just going to follow this as as a thing or you because you're 
the outdoor kids and indoor world thing is is next to me. But I wanna, I would love to talk. I'd love to do some more with the foraging myself. I don't know a lot about it, so I'd like to do something along those lines. There's a few things in the pipeline, but nothing in stone really. I've got a friend who grew up in a town who wants to do more of the primal type thing. So I'm probably going to do something with him. A couple of videos of him with like shooting deer. We're going to shoot some rabbits. Yeah, so he he likes um, the primal style of like the more the meat eater type of diet. All right. So he wants All to right. be able to produce his own meat for his own diet, that sort of thing. But yes, well, in the stone, it's all up in the air, really. I mean, I'd, I'd love to produce something really like, I'd go back to Clark's and what he's done for the for his farm. Um, to produce something like that for around the shooting world would be awesome because he's done more. You're just going to put more personality for, into it. Yeah, That's he's thing, done more it? for the farming world than I think anybody else has with five or six shows. What he's done is he's, he's, he's shown people. He's normalised it. Saying, what we used to say in the in the advertising industry he's opened the kimono yeah. on what a farmer's life is like and it's bloody hard you know yeah. and you know i used to say the other day you say oh you know all these things that farmers do that people think are distasteful and stuff so the countryside looks like it does and you enjoy it because of the people that work it if everyone stopped doing what they're doing it would be brambles in about 10 years the whole thing you know it, it works that way and, and farmers do have to do distasteful things you know it's a difficult thing you know i mean I, i've spoken to farmers who literally fall down in tears because they've got to kill a young male calf because they can't, economically can't feed the thing and they hate it and yeah. people talk about at- Farmers not caring about animals. You never, you, you've never seen anyone care like an animal, like like a dairy farmer who knows he's got a sick animal out there. He won't sleep. He won't he's sleep. Most he's got farmers his, generally don't. He won't. You know, in lambing season, they don't. They they care about those animals. You know, it annoys me that people don't realise that. And I think you're right. Clarkson's done a lot for that. Yeah. And you know, so absolutely right. We've got three minutes left. So I'm going to say thank you very much um, mm-hmm. before we get cut off. If anybody wants to find you, where do they find you? Well, quite easy, really. Go on to Instagram or TikTok or YouTube now and on um, Facebook as well. Uh, Eat the country, just one word. Um, my name's Tom Radford. And yeah, it's just trying to make a make things light, interesting and educational about uh, it's a lot of foraging, but it's going to be more sort of food content as well. Tom, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. You've been listening to the Outdoor Man podcast. We're glad you're here. We'd love to connect with you on social media. Find us on Twitter at Podcast Outdoor, on Instagram, Outdoor underscore Man underscore Podcast, on Facebook, Outdoor Man Podcast, and you can even reach us by email, dan at outdoorman.uk. Let us know your outdoor questions and be sure to tag us when you're outside living your best life. Until next time, be the example.